Hello, uh, on this uh, final day of um, the year 2020, and I know a lot of people just can't wait to put this year behind them, but I think um, to give me a chance to uh, explain and, and preach this message, I think you'll see that maybe 2020 wasn't the, the loss that um, a lot of people say it is, and um, maybe it, it gave us something we can carry into 2021 and uh, to see what God is going to do. And, and that's really what I wanted to talk about is how God is, moves in unexpected ways. Um, you know, we, as Christians, we often have this, this preconceived notion of how God can move. In our lives, you know, he's going to answer prayer this way. He's going to bless me in this way, and I refuse anything else. You know, and you know, we want to see answers to prayer. We want to see God move. We want to see revival. You know, if we want to see all those things, we need to th throw that box out that we keep God in, and just take off all the limits. You know, we all, oftentimes we just look for the familiar, um, usually just man-made religion. And this is where God is allowed to move and operate, and we miss everything that he's trying to do as a result. Um, you know, we miss the authentic move of God. And, you know, we need to remove the curtain that we hide the Holy Spirit behind and invite him to the front. If we really are serious about seeing, um, you know, God move in our churches, in our lives. We can't say, come Holy Spirit, but only back there in the corner where most people won't notice or be offended. It doesn't work like that. You know, that's not, that's not honoring to God, and he's not, he's not going to respect that or honor that. But um, I wanted to look at some biblical examples of this really being played out. Um. And I really, I, I, both of these stories, I, I just love both of these stories, especially Joseph. But first I want to go to, first, uh, so I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 5. And we learn about a man named Naaman. He's a commander of Aram's armies. And it's interesting because this should be about Israel, about the people of God. And here we have this pagan guy and the story kind of, you know, if there's a camera, the camera moves over to him and, and their perspective um, and a lot of the, during this time in Israel's history, they had a series of evil kings and whatnot, and that's where the prophets came in, but God was allowing these pagan nations to come and just plunder Israel because of Israel's disobedience. And that's where I want to start at verse two. It says, Aram had gone on raids and brought back from the land of Israel, a young girl who served Naaman's wife. Now she said to her mistress, If only my master would go to the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. Naaman went and told his master what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Therefore the king of Aram said, Go, and I will send a letter with you to the king of Israel. Now Naaman, um, he had leprosy. He was the commander of Aram's armies, and from what it appears here, he's very successful and um, highly uh, respected, And but he had leprosy, and this was ultimately going to end his life, but really limited what he can do. And then a young Hebrew girl who he brought back as a slave, and, and I read this today when I was preparing for this, and I'd never noticed this before, and I, you know, I, every time I read, God shows me something new. But, you know, this Hebrew girl was brought as a slave, a captured slave to this pagan nation um, to serve this commander's wife in, in whatever capacity. I, I don't know. Um, but she brought the presence of God with her. You know, she's a member of the people of God. And she was a witness to her master's household of the goodness of God and all that he can do. You know, God was moving in this girl, and all she had to do was speak. 
you know, and I just love her attitude. She could have just been like, poor me, I'm a slave. I'll just sit here and be spiteful and bitter, you know, but no, you know, God prompted her and she acted. God wanted to do something here, completely unexpected to, you know, unexpected for a fellow Hebrew, but certainly for this pagan nation, she would probably expect, you know, the word of the Lord come and she would prophesy disaster on this household for taking her, but no. God wanted to bless this household because she was in it, because he wanted to. You know, God doesn't need to justify himself to us. We just need to obey. And so he reaches out to uh, the king of Israel, and the king of Israel sends him to Elijah. And then Elijah sent him a message who said, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. Now verse 11, But Naaman got angry and left, saying, I was just telling myself, He will surely come out, stand, and call on the name of his God, and will wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin the disease. Aren't Abana and Barpa the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and left in rage. And and it's just like what I was saying. You know, he was so full of pride about his homeland and, and looks so down on Israel. And it's like, how, how much do we miss with that same attitude? You know, we get angry and blame God for not answering prayer and... and you know, God did answer our prayer, but we responded like Naaman, you know, with pride and looking down on where the answer was going to come from. You know, it didn't come from the person we thought it was going to come from. You know, it didn't come from the church I thought it was going to come from. You know, I, I remember listening to this, this guy preach and he was talking about, and he was, you know, talking about how he learned he he was at a healing service and people were praying and, and for others to be healed and whatnot. And, you know, a five, six-year-old kid comes up to him and says, I want to pray for the blind man. And, you know, he's just thinking in himself, oh, how cute, you know, this little kid going to go pretend, pray for, for a blind man. And he says, oh, sure, you go do that, you know, thinking how cute. And the kid goes up to the to the man who was blind, puts her her hand, you know, on on his head, and prays for him, and he can see just right then and there. The guy was just blown away, just again not expecting God to. Well, the God's not going to work through a five six year old. They can't understand. It's like no, the, it's not junior Holy Spirit in the kid. It's. God's power is not limited by the size of the vessel. God's not God's power is not limited to what we think he should be limited to. And it's just just like right here. He you know, Naaman thought, "Well, our rivers are better than your rivers. I'll go wash in them." And he wanted Elijah to personally come out and do it. You know, as a commander, he's probably used to um you know, being catered to. But and and again, just like, just like the Hebrew girl, you know, verse 13, his servants approached and said to him, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more should you do it when he tells you, wash and be clean? So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the command of the man of God. Then his skin was restored and became like the skin of a small boy, and he was clean. I mean, when God heals, he just didn't do a bare minimum healing. He just he gave him brand new skin that was, you know, just fresh, clean, pure. It didn't even have a wrinkle in it. He had the skin of a small boy now. And, you know, just, and, and praise God, Naaman had these, these people that would come talk to him, some sense into him. It's like you wanted to go see him, do what he says. You know, don't be so full of pride and religious garbage 
that you you just you're going to deny yourself the very answer that you were looking for. You know, we, we want from God, but we want from God on our own terms. You know, he, he gave us the answer that we were looking for and we threw it away. You know, just because it didn't come from the way we expected. You know, and, and, and again, his servants... These people, too, they were looking out for his best interest, not their own. You know, out of spite, they just could have, you know, chuckled to themselves, laughed and, and moved on, thinking, oh, he'll be judged in his leprosy. But, you know, they saw the bigger picture. And as a result, he set aside his pride and he was healed. But then, you know, God always had, had an, an intent and a purpose here, too. And... You know, just thinking about the bigger picture here, it says, verse 15, Then Naaman and his whole company went back to the man of God, stood before him, and declared, I know there's no God in the whole world except in Israel. You know, here's here's the bigger picture. You know, the great for Naaman being healed. You know, great for his servants and, the, and all of them you know, doing what's right. But the bigger picture, Naaman and his whole company declared there is no God in the world except for Israel. You know, and and just like that servant girl speaking up, she saw a need. She had an answer for that need. And she, and she didn't just live in bitterness and spite. She spoke up. Same with the other servants. We have... The people around us are in need, and we have the answer. You know, we have the hope of Christ, and we need to be sharing that, even with our enemies. You know, who knows what God would do if we would just get out of the way? We'd stop telling ourselves, well, that person can never be reached. That person will never be saved. That person will, you know, just, just forget all that. Keep looking for that opportunity, just like that girl is looking for that opportunity. Hey, wait a minute. There's a man in my homeland. His name's Elijah. Go see him. You know, just, hey, I know you have a problem here, but I know, I know a God who has an answer. His name is Jesus. You know, that's, that's the kind of mentality we need to have. We need to stop looking for the just religious answers for everything, and our, our answer needs to be Christ. And, you know, who knows what God will do? You know, as far as what it looks like, he might not do anything. But God, if you're being obedient, God did something. We may never see it. We may not know what it is. But if we're obedient, enough of the I prayed and nothing happened. You know, and, and I've struggled with that too. We need, we need to get rid of that mentality. If God told you to pray and you speak up and pray or, or not even pray, just talk to somebody you know, that's not going to be void. God's going to do something with that. And we just need to trust him that he is. And, and, and Joseph too, you know, and Joseph is good. He's got a whole large section, his story, Genesis chapters um, 37 through 50. His, that's where his story is found. And, um, and I'm not going to cover everything there. There's probably 50 sermons you can get out of, out of Joseph, but but I'm going to start at verse 5, right at the beginning. And it says, Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. So... He has a dream, shares it with his brothers, and naturally they hate it. I mean, do you want your little brother telling you that, um, you know, you're going to bow down and worship him? You know, probably not the best thing to be sharing with your older brothers. But here we are. And his brothers had other ideas. You know, of course, they reject that dream. 
So it says, you know, Joseph was sent to go get, deliver a, a message to his brothers and check on them. And it says, they saw him in the distance. And before he had reached him, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, here comes that dreamer. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what became of his dreams. So obviously there's, um, that's what they think of his dreams. But, you know, they carry out their plot. They throw him in a pit, but then they decide instead of killing him, they'll just sell him into slavery. You know, they can save their own conscious, uh, own consciences. And, you know, for Joseph, it looks like the dream is dead. But what is actually happening is that God is on the move in unexpected ways. You know, and then... Um, so, Joseph goes, is sold into slavery, and, and finds himself in Potiphar's house. And it says, the Bible says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor in his master's sight and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's household because of Joseph. You know, even, and even this pagan could see that, that God was with Joseph, that there was something special about him. I mean, the Egyptians had hundreds of gods, and he maybe just assumed this was just another one of the gods. But he could see something was different about Joseph. And that happened because Joseph was living for God in, you know, as a slave in a foreign land, just like the, the servant girl before him. Um, you know, serving it to the best of his ability for the purposes of God, instead of self-pity, he was partnering with God to see God's purposes done. And then again, Joseph is unjustly thrown into prison, and th those circumstances are, are another, another sermon for another time. Um... But again, he goes into prison, and even though he's there unjustly, he serves God just as he would, just as he always had, did what he knew how. And so the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. In this in interjection here, again, in prison, he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and the Lord made everything he did successful. You know, again, another incredible blessing was on Joseph because he didn't quit and pout. You know, he didn't wallow in self-pity and say, well, God didn't bless me the way I wanted or the way I was expecting, so I'm done. You know, he he's, he himself became a blessing to uh, others because he wasn't, you know, he didn't come with expectations. And, and ultimately, the final result, the dream is beginning to come true. And he's brought in um, to Pharaoh to interpret a dream. You know, everything that he had done up to this point put him in position to go interpret Pharaoh's dream. If he just retreated into self-pity, he would have missed it. If he said, God's not blessing me because it didn't happen the way I thought, he would have missed it. If he didn't, you know, be a godly man in the presence of God in all these circumstances... He would have never been brought before Pharaoh. And so he goes before Pharaoh, interprets the dream, and comes up with a plan. 
And the Bible says, This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find anyone like this? A man who has God's spirit in him. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as intelligent and wise as you. You will be over my house, and all my people will obey your commands. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, See, I am placing you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him with fine linen garments, and placed a gold chain around his neck. So again, not how Joseph thought things were going to go, but he's here. God brought him there. And, and there's there's a lot more. God could have put Joseph in Pharaoh's court any way he wanted. I mean, God could have, just like Elijah, picked him up and just dropped him off in Pharaoh's court and said, I sent this man to you, Pharaoh, listen to him. And, and that's that. you know. But God had purpose for bringing Joseph through the way that he did. And a lot of it was for Joseph's own good. You know, the he may have been a little arrogant and prideful in telling his brothers, you're all going to bow down to me. Maybe uh, Joseph needed to learn a little bit of humility first. Maybe Joseph needed to learn how to trust him. You know, I, you know God only knows what, what he was doing in Joseph's life there to bring him to Pharaoh's court, but he did bring him to Pharaoh's court. And, and not only that, you know, now all of Egypt knows that the Lord is God and that a godly man has been put in position to save them. And not only them, Joseph gets to save his family and so begins the nation of Israel in Egypt. Again, in a very unexpected way. So, you know, looking ahead to 2021... It's the church is it's really time. It's past time, but now more than ever, it's time to shed off, you know, the, the lukewarm typical responses that we give God. You know, we've we've been taught, you know, the blessings and prosperity gospel and and they do certainly come, but we've ignored the the repentance gospel the need for transformation gospel, the need to just give it all at the feet of Christ gospel. You know, put your, take up your cross and follow me gospel. You know, we need, where's that been? You know, we, we need to, we need to look for God in what seems like a what went wrong moment. And many, and this, this year has forced many people to look back and say what went wrong. How, how did we miss this? You know, I remember listening to a lady talk, give a talk about um, at 9-11, when 9-11 happened. She, you know, faithful intercessor, prayer warrior, faithful in praying for the nation, government, just everything. And after 9-11, she just, started crying out to God and said, God, I've been praying to you about this very thing. You know, what happened? What did I miss? And in in her own words, God God's response to her was, you didn't miss it. The, the church did. There weren't enough of you, enough people who cared. They were enjoying the blessing, enjoying the prosperity, enjoying the peace and freedom, and forgot all about God. You know, in, in, in 2020, people are, that we, I see it every day, and people just want to dismiss 2020, quickly move on and get back to normal. And I want to say something bold here and say, uh, um, I never want that normal again. You know, this year I've been praying more, been depending on God more. I've been watching his divine protection, seeing it more. You know, joining a national prayer movement in, in the election fraud and, and still seeing that play out and just watching the spiritual battle unfold. I've just never seen it before. 
And I'm just so grateful to be alive in this time in history to see things that I've never seen before. You know, God is showing us there is more to him than just pray and ask for a blessing and then move on with life. And, you know, I really think, and I'm going to go contrary to what a lot of people think and believe, but I think 2020 was a great year, and I praise God for it. I've watched his provision. I've watched his protection. I've just seen God move in so many ways this year, more than I ever have. And I praise God for it. I know people died. I know people have been hurt. I guess this came as a surprise this will come as a surprise to many people, but in 2019, people also died. People also got hurt, and nobody cared. But but this, this, this coronavirus makes people feel vulnerable. For the first time, maybe people thought, oh, it can happen to me. And they looked, and where their hope was, was, was exposed because they're looking for all these things where their hope was, and there was no answer. You know, the answer all along was, has always been in Christ. But they looked to government, and there was no answer. They looked to their bank account, their jobs. There was no answer. They looked to relationships. There was no answer. You know, they looked to other, you know, idols, other gods. There was no answer. The only answer was in Christ. And people still refuse that, and they just think, well, let's just get it over with, and it'll all go back to normal. And I don't think it ever will. And, and and praise God for that. I think that was the whole intent. You know, God's going to use this this 2020 to ensure that we never go back to a to a lukewarm, asleep church. You know, the, this year has really exposed the lukewarm church, and it really has given us all, every one of us, me too, a chance to re repent of that old way of religious living that's void of Christ and instead discover more of him in our lives. You know, 2020 was very necessary for that. And if, and just like the people in the examples, if we respond the right way, then the door that will lead to greater presence and the true blessings of God will be opened. You know, we'll see those revivals that we've been praying for. We'll see the 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 healing that we've been praying for, the, the breakthroughs that we've been praying for. We'll start to see all these prayers be answered that, you know, we thought the whole the whole time, you know, what am I doing wrong here? And 2020 showed us what we were doing wrong. Our, our hope were in other things besides Christ. And if, this, if you take nothing else away from 2020, let it be that your hope is in Christ alone. The, the, you know, every, every crisis we, we go through, 9-11, the, the economy crashing, you know, the, now the virus, it, it always comes back to where was our hope. You know, we looked, it exposed us that we were looking to other things instead of Christ. And these crises come and it gets our attention back on Christ and then, you know, like everyone wants, it all goes back to normal, crisis over, we're through it. And in truer sense of the word, it goes back to normal of lukewarm religious Christianity. And then we're right back where we started. You know, just like ancient Israel with the judges and the kings, we'd have a good king who followed Christ you know, years of blessing, and then a, and then an evil king would come, and back to, to paganism, and then the people, and idolatry, and the people would cry out to God again for deliverance, and it's just a continuous cycle. And, um, you know, and I, I preached a message on that a while back. It's just this continuous cycle. But let 2020 be the year that breaks that cycle, that, that you're going to tell, you know, 2021 is the year that... I, my whole life now revolves around Christ and nothing else. Him or nothing. It's, you know, him or nothing. I'm going to wake up, go to work, 
live my life and it's going to be all about Christ and I'm not looking back. I'm not going back to those those old, you know, lukewarm religious ways that, that produce almost nothing. You know, I'm not going to put God in this box. I'm not going to put the Holy Spirit behind a curtain and say, you can only move in the ways that I approve of and people won't be offended by. You know, that the time for the church, that church is dead and gone. You know, let, let it stay dead. Not the people, but that type of church. Let, just let it stay dead. We, we don't want that back. Let's never go back to that. I, me personally, I'm never going back to that. You know, if I have to, and this is an extreme example, I won't have to, but if I have to have church by myself, you know, I'm never going back to that. But praise God, I don't have to. <laughs> that's, that's an extreme example. There's plenty of other people too. You know, they're, they're, they're too, just, uh, we're, we're never, we're never going back to the, to the normal. We're never going back to 2019 Christianity. We want 2021 Christianity and relationship. So I meant this to be short and it was longer than I thought. You know, I'm, I guess if I was preaching in Sunday at a church, I would be that guy that always goes over the time limit and people miss their lunch plans and you know let that be a part of the old church too stop making lunch plans right after church if you have a three-hour service be available for god to move in a three-hour service you know don't make plans five minutes after church ends don't make plans at all let your sunday be free you know there's always emergencies and exceptions but if the pastor has normally preaches 30 minutes and he goes on for an hour and a half, praise God, you know? Okay, now I'm really going on. So, Happy New Year, and I truly and honestly hope and believe that God will bless you in the next year, but just be open for him to do that in a way that he has chosen. And... I think you'll love it. All right, God bless you. Be safe. I think I'm going to go on a bike ride tonight. I don't know. Just feel like going on an end-of-the-year night bike ride. So God bless you, and, and have a great uh, new year. Be safe.